Hey everyone, welcome back to CSC 231. Today we're going to be talking about matrix operations. So sort of like how you have numerical operations, things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, etc., etc. We also have matrix operations. So we have ways that we can add, subtract, multiply, divide matrices and so on. So some of you I know are familiar with linear algebra, linear analysis type of stuff. And I know uh, some people may not have taken those classes because, you know, those classes are the prerequisite for this class. So I'm going to try to keep the explanations sort of as accessible as possible. Really, we don't necessarily need to know the entire science behind all of these matrix operations. But at the same time, I want to give you all an idea of what you can expect when we do matrix operations. So that's actually why I pulled out the uh, pen and paper for this one, because I want to talk about it in a more, I guess, uh, mathematical sense. And don't worry, you will have plenty of opportunities to practice this in MATLAB as well. So first off, let's talk about matrix addition. So we're going to have, and again, I, I think I talked about this in the last set of videos, but when I talk about matrix addition, you know, you can also substitute this with array addition. So in the textbook, it uses arrays a lot. Uh, I'm going to pretty much use matrices and arrays pretty interchangeably from this point on. Okay, so let's suppose we have our matrices A and B, such that they have, they both have N rows and M columns. It's important that they both have the same number of rows and columns. So if we add them together, what we're going to get is a matrix such that the ith entry of A plus B here, of I and J. So remember that this notation here says that we're taking this entire matrix and we're accessing the entry at the ith row and the jth column. So what this entry is going to be is the I the i the entry in the ith row and jth column of a plus the entry in the ith row and jth column of b so what i have here are two example matrices and i actually normally you wouldn't say see these in actual matrix formatting but what i tried to do is i tried to put columns and semicolons where you would normally see them in matlab so really defining a you would do a equals you know 3, 2, semicolon, 1, 7, semicolon, 4, 3, semicolon, and similar to B. But what I tried to do is I tried to sort of match that up with the this uh, matrix form by putting commas and semicolons where you would normally see them in MATLAB. Um, I'm probably not going to do that too much in the future, but those of you who are not super familiar with matrices, I just wanted to sort of make that correlation with what it looks like in MATLAB versus what it looks like in this sort of matrix form. So if these are our A and B, this is just an example of matrix addition here, then A plus B is going to be the matrix where in every row and column entry, we're going to take A's and B's entries and add them together. So for the first row, first column, we're going to take A's first row, first column, which is three, and B's, which is four. And then, you know, I'm going to give myself some space here and put the result over here. So the first row, first column entry in A plus B will be seven. Then the second one, the first row, second column will be two plus seven, which is nine. Uh, we'll have one plus three, which is four. 7 plus 8 is 15, 4 plus 2 is 6, and 3 minus 8 is 11. So the, this is the resulting matrix addition of A and B. And um, I just want to make it super clear for people who don't really have linear analysis experience before that this is how we actually normally write matrices here. So there's no columns in between the, so there's no commas in between the columns. There's no semicolons in between rows, anything like that. We just have sort of spaces between the entries of a matrix. So 
and we'll uh, surround them with either, you know, sometimes a square bracket, sometimes parentheses. It depends on who's teaching the class usually. Um, I suppose that mine is normally square brackets, although sometimes they use parentheses. So I'll try to keep it consistent for this class. So what we have basically is a three by two matrix, the matrix with three rows and two columns of, consisting of seven and nine in the first row, four and 15 in the second row, and six and 11 in the third row. So that's matrix addition. It's pretty nice and easy. All you're doing is you're sort of iterating through every row and column and adding the matching array, uh, the matching entries here. The next operation is matrix subtraction, which works very similar to matrix addition. So what we have is that A and B are arrays with N rows and M columns. So they both have the same number of rows and columns as before. A minus B, the ith, the ith row and jth column, that entry of A minus B will be A's I jth entry minus B is I jth entry. So if we're doing A minus B for this example, we're going to do, instead of three plus four, this time it's three minus four, which is negative one. Two minus seven is negative five. One minus three is negative two. Seven minus eight is negative one. Four minus two is negative two, and three minus negative eight is three plus eight, which is 11. So both matrix addition and subtraction are pretty straightforward. Unfortunately, that's kind of where it ends in terms of basic matrix operations. So next we're gonna talk about multiplication and division. All right, so matrix multiplication is pretty complicated. So we actually kind of have to, uh, we have to kind of recurse through some uh, quick operations here. So the first one is the vector operation called the dot product. So we're gonna let A be a one by N matrix, or in other words, A is gonna be a, a uh, row array or horizontal array or row matrix, however you wanna say that. It's gonna be horizontal and it's going to have N entries. We're gonna let B be a vertical array or column matrix or column array, however you wanna say that with n entries in it. So A and B have to have the same number of entries. This is really important. A and B have to have the same number, number of entries, but one A has to be horizontal and B has to be vertical. So what we can do is we can take the dot product of A and B, and that gives us, what we do is we multiply the first element of each, we multiply the second element of each and the third element of each and the fourth element of each and so on and so on all the way until the nth element of each and then we add all of those the results of those multiplications together so in this case we have our a which is the vector one two and we have our b which is the vector four five so what we'll do so a one is going to be one b one is going to be four a two is going to be two and B2 is going to be five. So that gives us four plus 10 equals 14. And this is what we call the dot product of two vectors. Now we're gonna actually apply this in, now we're gonna actually apply this in sort of the next step, which is multiplication of a matrix by a column. So our next step is multiplying a matrix times a vector. So we're going to let A be a, a matrix with N rows and M columns and B be the vector with M entries, the vertical vector with M entries. So what we'll do is, if we're trying to multiply A times the vector B, what we're gonna do is we're gonna let A sub I be the ith row of A. And basically we take the dot product of each one, of every one of A's rows with B, and we just stick all the results in a new in a new vector. So the output of this output is actually an n by one column rather than an rather than an m by one column. So you can think of this as we're taking the number of rows from A and the number of columns from B in order to get our output. So as an example, what we're going to do is we're going to take the dot product of our first row this is a sub one in this case with B. 
then our second row with B, then our third row with B. So what this is going to look like is basically we'll have one times four plus two times five in the first entry of our output. Then we'll have seven times four plus negative one times five. And then finally eight times four plus zero times five. The output of this, basically uh, a times the vector b will be 14. We already figured this out from the last example. And this is 28 minus 5 is 23. And 8 times 4 is 32 plus 0 is 32. So we're almost there. We're almost at complete matrix multiplication. The last thing we need to do is we need to string together a whole bunch of multiplications of matrix times a vector in order to get a full matrix times matrix multiplication. So let's take a look at that really quick. All right, so the last part of multiplication is if we're working with multiplying some matrix A by some matrix B that isn't actually a column, but we're actually able to use our multiplication of a matrix times a vector in order to simplify our job here. So what we're gonna do is we're going to let A be an N by M matrix and B be an M by L matrix. So the restrictions that we have here is that A has to have as many columns as B has rows. And this requirement goes all the way back to our definition of dot product. And then is sort of carried through our definition of a matrix times a vector right here. But the reason why we have to have these be the same is because of the way we do the dot product in order to get every entry of our resulting matrix. So what I also want to define here is I want to define A sub I as the ith row of A and B sub J as the jth column of B. So A times B is going to be equal to the matrix where every column, I'm going to specify that these are all columns here. So every column of our resulting matrix is going to be A times some column of B. So in this case, this is AB1, AB2, all the way through ABL. And then in case you want the entire thing spelled out, the first row, first column is the dot product of A's first row and B's first column. Then we have a second row, B's first column, all the way down through A's nth row, B's first column. This is A's first row, B's second column, A's second row, B's second column, all the way through to A's nth row, B's second column. And we keep on repeating that pattern all the way until we get to A's first row, B's elf column, A's second row, B's elf column, all the way through A's nth row, B's elf column. So there's a lot of multiplication going on here. It's pretty painful. Um, basically, what we have is we're doing n times l dot products. And if you want to look at the actual numbers of uh, number multiplication that we're doing here, it would actually be m multiplications times n times l dot products. So a fucking mess. But a, b will end up having n rows and l columns. Um, I don't really want to do an example of matrix multiplication here. Um, and the reason why is I'm not actually expecting you to be able to do this matrix multiplication stuff by hand. Um, we, we have MATLAB to do this stuff for us. So we're pretty fortunate here. We don't need to actually worry about the details of all this. So we can set this aside for now and we'll mostly let MATLAB handle this. Um, the reason why I do want to talk about this though is because I really want to focus on this restriction here, that A has to have the same number of columns as B has rows. Otherwise, the multiplication just straight up doesn't work out whatsoever. So basically, I'm going to take us back to this example again. What we have is a 3 by 2 matrix times a 2 by 1 matrix. So in this case, we can think of N being equal to 3, M being equal to 2, and L being equal to 1. 
So because this has the same number of columns as this has number of rows, we're totally fine to do this multiplication. However, we can't take it the other way. So four, five times one, two, seven, minus one, eight, zero. This is not going to work. We have here two rows and one column times three rows and two columns. So the dot product isn't going to work out whatsoever. In fact, if we even try to do it this way, let's see what this would look like. We would be trying to basically do the first row, or the first column of this resulting matrix would be something like four, five times one, seven, and eight. We can't even do this dot product because as we showed in the dot product sheet that I have over here, let me find that really quick. You have to have a horizontal times a vertical array for this. That's just, that's part of the rules of what, of how dot product works. And if you're interested in why these rules are set up this way, I highly recommend taking classes like linear algebra two or linear, I don't know if there's a linear analysis too that really covers this kind of stuff definitely in linear algebra too is a it's a more theoretical take on this kind of stuff if that's your if that's your thing highly recommend it. it's so much fun but um we defined our dot product which is the fundamental operation of matrix multiplication here to be a horizontal array times a vertical array in that order so this ends up not making any sense so bad and if you feed this into matlab matlab's gonna be mad Let's actually take a look at what that looks like right now. Okay, so here's that same example problem right here. So I have A being the same matrix 1, 2, 7, negative 1, 8, 0, B being the matrix 4, 5. And if I take A times B in MATLAB like so, um, this is the one that should work because A and B have A's, or that A has the same number of columns as B has rows. So MATLAB does give us an answer. It's 14, 23, 32. Which is what uh, which is what we calculated on paper just a moment ago. If you try to do b times a, let's actually look at the error that MATLAB gives us here. Error using the multiplication operator. It's giving us incorrect de uh, dimensions for matrix multiplication, and it's going to point out that we need to check the number of columns in the first matrix matches the number of rows in the second, and that is by definition of matrix multiplication. That's what we have to do. Um, ignore the second part for now. I'll actually get into that in not too long from now. But what I want to do is I want to actually keep track of what C of uh, what A times B is. I'm going to label that C and that'll be useful for us in just a second when we talk about matrix division. All right, so another big matrix operator that we have is called matrix division. And there's two types, left division and right division. Uh, we are not going to go into this in the same detail as matrix multiplication. This, if matrix multiplication was, uh, you know, tedious enough and arguably probably more, that discussion is probably more in depth than we really need for this class. Uh, this is by far extremely way too in depth for this class. So I'm briefly going to go over this, but we have two types of division, left division and right division. So for left division, we're going to let A be an n by m matrix and B be an n by one matrix. So B is a column vector. So then A left divide B gives the m by one column vector x such that A x equals B. So we're kind of undoing matrix multiplication here. So dividing A by B, left dividing A by B is going to give us the x such that a x equals b. And our matrix division, right division, is we're going to take c, which is an n by m matrix, and d, which is a 1 by m matrix. So this is a row vector in this case. So d divided by c gives the n entry row vector x such that x c equals d. And the syntax for this is as I've written it. So you would do a backslash b to take the left division of A and B, and you do D slash C to do uh, D right divided by C. Now, if you're anything like me, you might have expected uh, matrix multiplication and division to work a lot more like uh, matrix addition and subtraction, where 
we take the each entry in every row and column of A and B, we you know multiply them together or we divide them by each other, stuff like that. And unfortunately, uh, math is hard, so we don't get to do that. But MATLAB does actually give us tools to do something like that, and that's what well, and that's what they call element by element operations. So the way you say it, you tell MATLAB, hey. I want to do an element by element operation on these two matrices is you put a dot in front of each operator. So if you do a dot star b, rather than doing trying to do regular matrix multiplication, MATLAB is going to say, okay, well, I see the dot star here instead of just a star. So I'm actually going to take every ith jth element of a and b, and I'm going to multiply them by each other. So in this case, you actually have to have A and B have the same number of rows as each other and the same number of columns as each other, rather than the whole shenanigans that we had with matrix multiplications um, and matrix divisions specified, oh, well, A has to have the same number of columns as B has rows and stuff like that. Nope. In this case, A and B have to be the same size. So what we do here, if we have element by element multiplication, is we just take the element in A's I throw in jth column and multiply it by the element in B's I throw in jth column. And we stick that in A times B's I throw in jth column. We have the same thing for right division. We have the same thing for left division. Remember that in this case, these are the numerical right and left divisions, not the uh, matrix, general matrix right and left divisions. Uh, I'm saying that sort of with a grain of salt because really the numerical right and left division is the same thing as the matrix right and left division only applied to a one by one matrix. Um, and that's the whole thing of everything in MATLAB is a matrix. There's no actual numbers because they are actually matrices there. Regardless, and then we have this uh, element by element power operator where basically we take every element of A to the power of every element of B, like so. So taking a look at MATLAB, I have two matrices that are the same size as each other, and we can look at what happens when we uh, do the element element by element operation. So if we do A period star B, the element by element multiplication, get the matrix of, okay, well, this is going to be 1 times 2 in the first row, first column, which is 2, 2 times 4 in the second uh, first row, second column, which is 8, uh, 3 times 5 here, and 4 times 6 there. So that's as expected. We do a dot slash b, which is going to be a little bit ugly, but it's nothing that we don't, it's something that we can't expect either. And if you go through everything, calculate all of these out by hand, you'll, you should see that everything matches up just fine. A dot backslash b is the one that is going to look a little bit funky, but it still checks out that this is, uh, this is going to be basically two divided by one or one left divide two. So going to be 2 left divide 4, or 4 divided by 2. This is going to be 5 divided by 3, or 3 left divide 5. This will be 6 divided by 4, or 4 left divide 6. So this is as expected. And then we have a dot caret b, oh, a dot caret b, or a, well, we're taking the power, every element of a to the power of every element in b. So this is 1 squared, this is 2 to the 4th. 3 to the 5th, and 4 to the 6th, which all checks out. So now, as we're going through chapter 3 here, I'm actually going to let you all read sections 3.6 and 3.7 by yourselves, and we can talk about them in lecture if you want to learn about what those functions are. But basically, what they are is they are a bunch of built-in functions that have to do with arrays, or sorry, matrices, rather, of some sort. So things like finding the mean value of all elements of the vector, the median value of all elements of a certain vector, uh, minimum, maximum, sum, all that kind of stuff. And we will use these uh, functions a bit later, so I'm more than happy to redefine what those functions do. And then we also have uh, the random functions like rand, um, which has many possible different variants. So you can look at what passing in different arguments into rand does in terms of giving us random numbers. So it's a very helpful command because sometimes we, we do actually need random numbers. So 
taking a look at sections 3.6 and 3.7 will be very useful for you at this point. So now let's take a look at some examples of how to take matrix operations and solve problems with them. So the first thing I want to do is remind you all of a couple of concepts that you should be familiar with from maybe some physics or some calculus or stuff like that. So let's say we have a vector and a vector has a uh, a vector in a Cartesian plane at least has a horizontal and vertical magnitude. It also has a uh, sort of total magnitude here. So if we have a, mag a vector with total magnitude m and angle theta from the uh, from the origin, then we can figure out the y magnitude by taking m times sine of theta, and we can take we can find out x by taking m times cosine theta. Similarly, if we have a vector with a horizontal and vertical magnitude of x and y respectively, we can figure out the total magnitude m by saying m equals the square root of x squared plus y squared. Finally, we also have vector addition. So if we do something like this vector plus this vector like this, we can do the vector addition of the two by sort of adding the vertical and horizontal magnitudes together. So the effect that we'll get is sort of something like this, where we add in this vector here, and the resulting vector has basically the addition, basically we add this vertical magnitude with this vertical magnitude and this horizontal magnitude with this horizontal magnitude to get the resulting vector here. So we can do all of this in order to solve some really cool vector-based problems. Like for example, we can figure out force vectors. So if you take different vectors of force applied from different areas and add them together, you get the total force that determines the net acceleration of a certain object. So let's look at a problem, an example of that problem right now. So let's take a look at this example. Suppose we have a object here represented by, by uh, some kind of point mass. There are three forces acting on that object. Let's say we have force one with a uh, angle of negative 20 degrees and a, for, a magnitude of 400 newtons. We have force two with an angle of 30 degrees and a magnitude of 500 newtons. And force three with a angle of 143 degrees and a magnitude of 700 newtons. What we want to do in order to figure out the net total force on this object is we want to figure out the vertical and horizontal magnitudes of each one of these vectors, and then we can add those vertical and horizontal magnitudes together in order to get the final resulting vector. And then what we can do is we can figure out the angle and the magnitude of that resulting force. So we can actually use vectors here to say, okay, let's say that we'll take vectors of the form x, y, where x is going to be the first row of our column vector and y is going to be the second row of our column vector. So the resulting force x, y is going to be equal to f1, x, f1, uh, y, plus f2, x, f2, y, plus f3x, f3y. Okay, so what I have is I have inputted in the magnitude and angle of each vector, uh, the angle being in degrees. Uh, something I want to point out here is that I did negative 20 degrees for uh, vector 1 here, because if you remember, if you remember from math, what we have is Anytime you have an angle clockwise from the origin, we count that as a negative angle, and an angle that is counterclockwise from the origin is a positive angle. So this is positive 30 degrees, this is positive 143 degrees, and this is negative 20 degrees here. So I've inputted in all that data, and we can use this in order to figure out what F1, F2, and F3 are going to be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create vectors of the form x, y. So what we can do is we can start constructing our vectors like so. So we can do the vector f1 equals the magnitude f1m times, we'll do a scalar multiplication here, and then we'll do our vectors uh, of x and y values. So our x value in this case is going to be the 
cosine uh, in degrees of f1 d and then our y will be will multiply the magnitude times sine in degrees of f1 d and the result of this is we have this vector here then we can do something similar for f2 so i'm just going to replace all the ones with twos in this part of the equation here f2 f2 and f3 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 like so and now if we want to get the overall force what we can do is we can add all of these together to get the x the vertical and horizontal force magnitude so we'll say f equals f1 plus f2 plus f3 and that gives us that f is a total force with uh, 249 newtons in the horizontal direction actually 250 newtons in the horizontal direction and 500 34 newtons in the vertical direction. And now what we probably want to do is we want to figure out what the magnitude of F is. So we can use the equation that we used before. So Fm equals F, the first entry of F, which we determined to be our X squared, plus the second entry of F squared. We have to take the square root of this whole thing. So that's my bad. Uh, I should SQRT of all of that. That's our magnitude is 589.9768 newtons or 590 newtons. And if we want to figure out the angle of this force, what we can do is we can take, uh, we can say that the angle of F in degrees is equal to the arctan or the tangent inverse in degrees of uh, the Y value of that force, which is the second entry of F divided by the X value of that force, which is the first entry of F. And our angle is 64.9 degrees. So this is just one of many examples of how we can use uh, vectors and matrices and all sorts of cool operations in order to solve cool problems. There are more examples in section 3.9 of the textbook, and I highly recommend checking them out. And I'm more than happy to practice some of these in class. So let me know if any of you want any of that. All right, well, thank you all for watching. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.